Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to come listen to what Vic and I have to say. If you recognize your work, and there are some examples up here, it's not specifically that we're identifying your work. It's uh, that was the example that came to mind when we wanted to illustrate the point we were trying to make with that slide. If you have questions about the process that are very, very project specific to something that you're working on, I'd also encourage you to reach out to us and schedule a separate meeting to talk about your specific project. So I guess we'll get kicked off and Vic wants you all to take a deep breath, we'll take a seat and we'll try not to end up like Vic's pet panda. He showed this presentation to his pet panda and the reaction was not so positive. A <laughs> panda puts up with a lot. We're going to start probably the first 45 minutes to an hour with stormwater development services items and then move into the IPRC items. Just a quick recap about why we're all here. The state legislature passed House Bill 3167. And what this does is it changes the way that the city interacts with platting and says that the governing body, or the city planning commission in this case, has authority over construction plans and plats. They always had plats, but construction plans are the new and somewhat um, controversial item. It does change the planning process, though, too, in the initial filings have to be reviewed within the first 30 days and revisions within the first 15. It also talks about how comments on those plans and plats need to reference a code or a citation to the law. So part of, part of the city's reaction to this is also adding some filing prerequisites. So because we need to act within a certain period of time on a filed application, then we've got a checklist or platting or IPRC would have a checklist of items that you need to provide in order to file that application. And that's going to include things like an application form, the fee and studies and any other related documentation. As always, we offer informal meetings. You know, contact us, reach out to us, we'll schedule some time with you to talk through your specific project. One of the things that's new about that is we're going to ask you to sign a form letter that is basically acknowledging that you're not filing an application by submitting exhibits for this meeting that we're going to have. The House bill changes don't affect studies, permits, contracts, or other state agency items. And that's important because we'll come back to that in a little while. And so we've rearranged our processes just a little bit so that the House bill and the shot clock and the necessity, necessity for C Plan Commission to take action on final license plans, for example, um, that's all changed. This is a very simplified version of how our process, for example, platting used to go before the House bill came to effect. You'd submit your application, three weeks later you'd have comments, and then for a unset period of time, the project would work to resolve those comments. Once all the comments were cleared, your plat would be filed and you'd move forward. The House bill changes that. It kind of turns it on its head. So the application, before it comes in, before it's filed for review, you would need to complete some of those studies and prerequisites ahead of filing the application. And then once the application is filed, you would have action from city staff and city planning commission within the 30 and 15 days that we are expected to provide a response in. And I'm flipping a little bit between pre-house bill and post-house bill here. On the stormwater side of things, this probably looks familiar. You have a, if you have a concept plan, you do a conceptual ISM plan. If you have a preliminary plan, do a preliminary ISM plan and so on and so forth. The process that we're going to is really one where you have a drainage study. No matter what your application, 
you have a drainage study that supports that development application. This is an example of the pre-house bill stormwater and IPRC process. Before you go to your pre-sub, which is a formal part of the process, you'd have to have preliminary arson plan and fire arson plan submitted. And then eventually you'd need to have the fire arson plan accepted before going to pre-con. That's also changed. So since the House bill tells us the construction plans have to go to Sea Plan Commission for action, and it's a change to the Chapter 212 part of the Municipal Code, which governs platting, then the concern that we had with fire arson awesome plans was that, was that these included construction plans in support many times of a final plat. The implication being that a fire arson awesome plan would have had to go before the Sea Plan Commission for denial or approval. So our solution to this, our process solution to this, is to make a clear distinction between engineering analysis in a drainage study and construction plan review, either through IPRC or through the grain permit process. If you've been through our process in the last few years, you probably also recognize that the final arson plan associated with your subdivision, your infrastructure plans, in some ways created a, a duplication of the review because construction plans were submitted to the final arson plan and construction plans were submitted through IPRC. By eliminating the final arson plan step, we're focusing all of our comments, all of our review and effort on the IPRC plan review or the grain permit review. Before you start trying to follow this process flow diagram that flashed up there for you, I want to point out a few key features. There's, about, there's three obvious uh, process trains up there. The top one is really your final short form plat, maybe a com small commercial site or infill project. The next one is your preliminary plat, final plat process, which is really your largest subdivision process. And the last one is where you're not playing at all and you're only coming through the drainage review process because you have a grain permit obligation. I want to highlight stormwater pre submittal meetings. We would always encourage you to come talk to us ahead of submitting your drainage study. At these meetings, you get to meet with my staff and your reviewer and ideally reach consensus on the scope of the, the downstream assessment and which specific problems we're trying to resolve through your engineering analysis. For example, if there's downstream known flooding constraints, then that's something you'd want to know about before submitting your drainage study. This will work eventually. As I'm looking at this, I'm realizing it's not quite as easy to read as what I'd hoped, but let's start the top run, or stop the top row. So ideally we're staying with a pre middle meeting, and the first question we need to answer is, are we platting? If we're platting, then all the house bill changes are effective. We'll start with the top row. So your drain study or, or, if applicable, flood study would need to come in for review and be accepted. And if there's no public infrastructure associated with it, you would get a letter from the stormwater group that says you, your study is accepted and you can move forward with filing your plat with the planning group. Once your final plat's recorded, you'd move on to the grain permit process and in the grain permit, you would provide your civil construction plans for review We'd look at that for compliance with the drainage study that you've previously provided. And if, if applicable, you'd also get your floodplain permit and maintenance agreement at that time. On the next row, if you're coming in with a concept plan, then we've drawn a distinction between a drainage study that supports a concept plan and a preliminary plan. The drainage study for a concept plan, we would call a, call a master drainage study because it should set up a framework for all future phases of that development. The drainage study, once accepted, you'd move forward to filing your preliminary plat or concept plan. That would go through the C plan commission process. And then there's a possibility that between preliminary platting and infrastructure plan preparation, 
your drainage analysis may need to be updated. A good example of this might be if you made some sweeping assumptions about your detention pond geometry, and now you've gone through and started preparing construction plans, you know a lot more about your detention pond geometry and need to update the engineering analysis to better reflect your proposed construction plans. Once your construction plans are filed and approved, you'd go through the typical IPRC um, paperwork exercises, getting your CFA done, getting your easements recorded. And during that same process, that same time frame, you'd also submit what we're calling a stormwater pre-construction checklist, which in some ways takes elements of the final lesson plan and adds that at the back end of the review process. It's just a checklist with a few questions like, did you get the other state agency permits that you're supposed to get before gun construction? On that last row down there, it's really just your grading permit process. So perform a drainage study, get that accepted, submit your grading permit, and then move on to building permits. So I'm gonna plug the SDS pre similar meetings right now. So for a few years now, we've been scheduling time, setting aside time, Tuesdays 1.33 and Fridays 10 to 12. We have a standard form letter with a few questions about your project and a request for an agenda and a site plan and other exhibits that you think would be helpful for the discussion. Ideally, we, like I said, we walk out of that meeting with a consensus on the zone of influence, the limits of analysis, and perhaps the types of analysis that we need. The, it's probably more successful when we prepare minutes or the project prepares minutes and distributes those for review so that a year from now, when the drainage study or the plat comes in, we will remember what was said. Just a screenshot of the form letter for those meetings, some project information and uh, some agenda items. So drainage studies for a subdivision, for example, probably consist of an HMS model, a HECRAS model, and other engineering analysis. And the idea is that similar to the way that you as a designer may update those models as you move through the design process, we see the drainage study and the supporting engineering as sort of a living document that can be updated through the various stages of that development. The other thing I want everyone to keep in mind is that the drainage studies are submitted in support of a specific development application. Most, if we're really honest, we, we may not really care as a community if the drainage study is perfect or not. Most of the time what we're focused on is getting those other development applications moving forward. And so we want to make sure that those, the study and the development application align and they match up. And the study should prevent a, provide a plan that supports that development application moving forward. All drainage studies would include a downstream assessment through the zone of influence. They should all include some sort of description of what you did, why you did it, what was weird about your project, and a hydrologic analysis. It's hard to have a drainage study without some H&H &H in there. The other items that are relevant to the review of your submissions, they may come up during your stormwater pre-submittal meeting. So again, I'd always encourage you to come and talk to us about your specific project and your specific needs. The master's drainage study, which I touched on earlier when I was attempting to explain the process diagram. A concept plan is required for any development over a square mile in size, or if you propose to bring preliminary plats and phases. You would still provide a downstream assessment through the zone of influence. And that scales depending on the size of your project. We, we sort of use that 10% rule of thumb as a, as a leaping off point to determine the scale of your analysis. But if your project is a square mile or larger, that's a big analysis. Probably more as a cartoon illustration, you'd also include detention, location, and volumes in your study. And the intent really is that if we have a concept plan, more than a square mile that is going to be developed, there needs to be a framework in place so that when future development phases come in for review, there's already something there that says, here's the plan, here's where detention will be needed when phase 10 comes in or whatever that happens to be. 
And again, being a, a, a model or a collection of models, the intent is that drainage data can be updated as needed to continue to support the development applications that come in. So I'm just gonna try and offer a couple of examples. Here's Walsh Ranch, about 10 square miles of development, arguably the largest in Fort Worth. And so the scale of that study would be different than your corner 7-Eleven. This is one of the exhibits that they provide with the study. The drainage areas that are delineated there, that's Mary's Creek watershed. For most projects, we would suggest the Trini River and the Federal Floodway projects as an aqua outfall. However, Lake Benbrook controls most of the area drains the Trini River in this area through Fort Worth. And the peak discharges in the Federal Floodway projects are more impacted by the Mary's Creek watershed. And so if we're developing or plan to develop in the future about 20% of that watershed, this project may impact the Federal Floodway projects through Fort Worth. And their analysis showed that they would potentially if it wasn't mitigated. And so because of the scale of some of these developments, it's important that we have a plan moving forward to mitigate impacts. Another concept plan, a little smaller, about two or three square miles. They provide a drainage analysis, which basically consisted of a drainage area map and some cartoon locations of detention ponds. And the point there, though, is that it provides some idea of how we're going to develop that project in the future. It's actually quite detailed. They've gone as far as identifying the size of the outfalls under the road downstream of the project. But this just gives you an idea of the level of detail. So when it comes to what is contained in a drainage study and how much documentation do we need, how much, what's the level of detail? It really depends on your development application that you're seeking to get approved. So, for example, when do you need a hydraulic analysis? Well, if you need a water service elevation for a finished floor and your final plat, you'll need a hydraulic analysis. If you're trying to size an easement for a channel on your preliminary plat, you might need a hydraulic analysis but perhaps simplified, since we're only talking about an easement on a preliminary plat. Still, the initial drainage study should provide a sound basis for any future applications. And I'll get to that in just a minute with a few more examples where I've tried to illustrate where and how the drainage study and preliminary plat applications need to overlap and align. There's been a few conversations already about detention location and detail. And it, it really, again, is just trying to support the development application that you have. So on a preliminary plat, you probably have dimensions on your preliminary plat for that open space lot that contains your detention pond. So you need some, some detail to describe that. But if your drainage study is in support of infrastructure plans, then maybe you need a little bit more detail so the two documents match and align. The, the point I'm trying to illustrate with this one is that all drainage studies will have some hydrology. They all have some downstream assessment, with some exceptions. They should all include some mitigation analysis, if applicable. And at various, various stages throughout the development process, you will be sizing easements. So on a preliminary plat, you mainly need to run a normal section to estimate the size of that or width of the easement. But by the time you get to infrastructure plans, your hydraulic analysis might be more detailed. Your easement size is a little bit more refined. The drainage study checklist that we put together, it, it's a compilation of a lot of the existing checklists with additional detail and some more questions. The intent is it's a communication tool between you and your reviewer, reviewer for the project. It's also there to guide and prompt both you as the project or engineer, but also the reviewer in things that they may need to see to support future development applications. The checklist, the drain state checklist that we developed is quite, I think, exhaustive. The, it would apply to subdivisions in most cases. 
many of the items there may not apply to a small commercial infill site. This is just the first cover page. So in, in the middle there, you've got a question, and below that you've got a list of attachments. So this question is asking, what is your goal? What development application are you seeking to get support with this drainage study yet? And the level of detail, the level of documentation is going to depend somewhat on what it is you're trying to get approved after the drainage study is reviewed and accepted. It's also a list of potential attachments. Many of the attachments would apply in most cases, you know, your drainage area maps, a description of what it is you're doing, your pre-post project maps, things like that. It's also a planning tool. There's a question on the second sheet of that checklist that asks, what else are you going to need to construct this project? Will you need a maintenance agreement? Will you need public infrastructure plans? Is your plan to outfall across a park? Will you need a park conversion for that? So just trying to identify those things early on in the process that may, may affect your development or you may need to be working on between submitting the drainage study and going to construction. One of the things that you'll need to file a preliminary plat, final plat, or infrastructure plan set is a drainage study acceptance letter. This is a form letter that we've developed and you would submit that with your drainage study so that your reviewer can issue an approved letter once they're done reviewing and accepting your drainage study. Or you would come to Stormwater Development Services staff and we would, fill that, we would help you fill that out. And if there's an accepted study or you don't need a study, then we would sign that and you could use that as part of filing your application with platting or IPRC. This letter also contains a few checkboxes which are really intended to be a communication to other staff, such as, uh, let's say, you submit a drainage study for a preliminary plat. Then if you take that same drainage, drainage study acceptance letter that identifies that a preliminary plat would be okay, you take that to IPRC, IPRC is probably going to say, I see a drainage study was only accepted for preliminary plats. You may need to check with SDS. Just an example of what it looks like as a, as a form letter. I want to highlight part of it. This is where the SDS team or your reviewer would fill out the uh, study number, whether or not you have an accepted checklist, Sorry, I accept the drain study. The bottom item is really for projects that are less than one acre and platting. So it asks questions like, is your total disturbance less than one acre? Are you part of a common plan? Do you have off-site areas that are significant and drain through your project? Is there any known regulated or adjacent flood risk that might impact your plat application? This part of that form letter is basically just confirmation that the development application that you told us you're seeking on the checklist, drainage study checklist, we agree that your drainage study is accepted to that level. So those two sets of questions are lined up there. This is an example of a recent drainage study that we received. You can see there, there's some drainage area delineations, some lot layouts, color code flow paths. It's, it's a pretty good exhibit if you're trying to describe your drainage study analysis for that subdivision. What I want to highlight is this drainage path for an offsite area, including a road that drains between lots. This is an example of where a drainage study and the preliminary plat, for example, need to line up. As part of the review of that preliminary plat, we said your drainage study shows a flow path between lots. You're going to need a drainage easement there. 
It turns out the development didn't want to include a drainage area there because they would have had to lose a lot. We understand that. Let's change the drainage study. So they came back with a revision that changed the proposed flow path for that area so they no longer had to show a drainage easement on the preliminary plat. This is another development that um, probably came in maybe a year ago now. It's a relatively small subdivision, maybe 80 to 100 lots, and it drains to a very large creek. At the preliminary plat stage, all they really needed to show was that they don't have an impact to the downstream system, which in this case can be done through an HMS model because hydrologically the development's insignificant compared to the overall watershed. It would have been, actually it's a little difficult to see here. Depending on how good your eyes are, there are a couple of little open spaces between lots. In here, in here. They sort of line up with the streets. So you can sort of imagine that if you're playing the drainage for that subdivision, there's a storm drain in those streets, and that storm drain outfalls between lots. And so the only thing I personally would have added to that drainage plan was just an illustration showing, here's our plan for where our drainage system would be so that we all agree where the easements go within that preliminary plat. But it worked fine anyway. All I'm really trying to illustrate with this series of hydrologic maps is that each drainage study should have a zone, sorry, a downstream assessment through the zone influence that really supports that development moving forward. And so many features in the drainage analysis could be updated as you move through the development process, but we, we really want to set that downstream assessment and that mitigation plan early on. You can see in this case the development was downstream of an already fully developed watershed, which may have simplified things just a little bit for them. But most of these things in the initial hydrologic study don't change. Your offsite drainage areas, your soil types, your land use, it's all more or less fixed. And so the intent would be that no matter your level of development application, you have a downstream assessment that supports all future phases of that development. The only other thing I wanted to point out was I actually quite like the way this is presented. You've got your drain jerry map and your HMS elements overlapped over the drain jerry map. So you, it's very easy to understand where your nodes are, where your subbasins are, where your routing is. This particular development chose to include the hydraulic analysis all the development. And so theoretically, this drainage study between the HMS models and the HECRAS models could have quite easily carried this development through from preliminary plat to construction plans. Because for the preliminary plat, we know that there was no adverse impact based on hydrology. And for the final plat and construction plans, we have a HECRAS model. So the construction plans are supported in that we know starting tailwaters for the storm drain system and we know where we should be setting our finished pad elevations to make sure we have two feet of freeboard. The same with the final plat. You can set your lot minimum finished floor elevations based on this study. And this actually all came in as a preliminary arson plan for preliminary plat. This is another recent example. Um, again, I'm not uh, specifically picking on any particular firm, it's, these are recent examples that were brought up and I thought were useful for illustrating um, some, of the, some of the things we want to see in drainage studies, which is really just a, a plan, a, a concept for how we mitigate impacts. And so this is, this is fairly clear, you've got a subdivision with a couple of detention ponds at each outfall. What I didn't show you here in the slides is that each pond includes a pipe outfall, a concentrated discharge. 
on the western side, that concentrated discharge would have been to a field, basically. The contours show some, maybe a little flow path, but it could also be a windrow along that fence line. On the eastern side, there was a detention pond with quite a detailed HECRAS analysis. The advantage here is that the project had a, a roadside ditch and already concentrated receiving facility to receive that concentrated outfall from the detention pond. The only thing that I would have, if it was me, would have liked to add to that plan was just on the western side of the development, how we conveying the concentrated flow to an aqua outfall? What's the plan for getting it that far? The reason that's maybe important to include this in your drainage study is because if, for example, the plan was to install a pipe, then we want to know what the total scope of those off-site facilities would be before we submit construction plans. This is another recent project that um, came up in the last couple of weeks, and it's a small commercial, I say small, it's about 20 to 25 acre commercial development with a lot of off-site drainage areas. And the, the analysis that was provided was a very rigorous uh, HMS and downstream assessment. It was probably good for a concept plan. And the development at the time, the developer's engineer at the time did check the concept plan box, and that made sense. The analysis and the communication there aligned. What we weren't really sure about was the, the actual intended development process that the project wanted to go through. Most commercial developments like this would start with a preliminary plat and then final plat in phases. And so knowing that about the development process, we checked in with the engineer to make sure that we're on the same page as it turned out, I think their plan was to go through the preliminary plat process rather than the concept plan process. And so we offered a little bit of feedback on how we might adjust the submittal and the analysis. So one example is that the modeling included a single pond, whereas the project site plan showed two ponds. It also showed that a large 60-something uh, 60, 60 acre offsite area bypassed those detention ponds. It just wasn't 100% clear how that would work in practice and how that might impact the easement that is supposed to be shown on the preliminary plat. So again, this is just an example of how the preliminary plat document and the drainage study need to consider one another. That works, I guess. So just conceptually, if we're going to bypass those upstream areas through the project site, the preliminary plat probably needs to show a drainage easement for whatever facility is proposed to do that. And if we're going to update this particular modeling analysis to support what was shown on the preliminary plat, then we may need to just tweak the HMS modeling slightly. Earlier, I'd alluded to some projects that wouldn't necessarily require a downstream assessment, but may need a down, sorry, a drainage study. So this usually comes up when someone wants to plat a property less than one acre, but that property has significant offsite areas and therefore a need for easements and finished floors and other things you would normally see on a final plat. I use this example because a couple of weeks back, um, someone called me up and said, hey, I'm looking at buying a piece of property, it has a little ditch in the back of it. Um, do you think we can fill in that ditch and use the property? Well, I looked it up in GIS and sure enough, there's a good sized ditch back there. They're gonna need to plat the property to eventually get building permits. And part of that planning process means de determining appropriate easement widths and finished floors in that final plat. I'm not gonna ask for an impact analysis because it's less than one acre. There's a few storm drains that outfall to this gentleman's property of interest. And so you can see why you may need a drainage study to appropriately set easements 
on a final plat for this property. Because of the offsite areas, there's also some flood risk. It doesn't help that it's immediately upstream of a TxDOT culvert designed in the 70s. So moving on to what is basically the back of the drainage study process, it's the stormwater pre-con checklist. And we took, I'm going to back up just a little bit. So we took the final isomer plan and we broke it out into its individual elements and put those in different buckets. Some in the drainage study, the analysis section, some in the construction plan section. And on the back end, we call it a pre-con checklist. And all that's really doing is asking, did you get the other approvals that you need before you go to a pre-con or before we approve you for construction through the grain permit process? It looks basically the same as the other checklist I've flashed up there for you, but it asks a slightly different question. It's asking, did you get these other, other approvals? Whether or not you need a TRD permit or a park conversion or a grading permit or a floodplain development permit, whatever that was, before you go to construction, is that in place? I know I've thrown a lot of information at you. Do you have any questions? We've got about 10 minutes to cover a few items. We're going to get them up on the website for you, um, but right now you would have to send us an email at SDS. Okay. Good question, thank you. It's mind -blowing. I'd hope to have them published ahead of this meeting so I can flash up a slide saying, here's the website, go find them here. But that, did, that wasn't possible, unfortunately. So if the plan, I guess the, um, the SDS pre-submittal meeting, is that recommended just before any project gets submitted or if it's just of any kind of complication? I wasn't really clear on that. I would encourage you to come talk to us on any development that you're doing. Okay. Um, we, we schedule these meetings for either 30 or 60 minutes. And ideally, if you've already got some background or some existing conditions information, that always helps. Uh, some folks um, will walk in there with a pretty solid plan on what they've got or what they plan to do, and we just sit there and go, that looks great. And there's other folks that walk in and say, I think my site's here. Can you tell me something about this particular location? Uh, you mentioned that you could, for different levels of submittals, you might have less necessary information on the drainage study. So if you wanted to just submit for the preliminary plat approval and kind of keep it more conceptual level, and then later on, once you're further along in design, come back with your full construction plan drainage study. Would you just reapply with that with a revised application? Yes. Or okay. For those of us that have worked in Fort Worth and Well, uh, what is Z O one or Z O I? Sorry, I should have explained that. Zone of influence. So the zone of influence is typically based on the ten percent rule of thumb. So should you continue analysis downstream until your project is less than 10% of the overall watershed you're studying at that point. All right, Logan. What's, uh, when is this implemented? Starting today? If you guys have been doing business with us recently, we've implemented this already. Uh, in order to react to state law changes that became effective September 1, we basically scrambled to do something that complied with state law and we are very much at this point ready to share it with everybody in a more fully thought out way. Okay, so f next question. Projects that have already accepted preliminary ice swims moving forward. Thank you oh. for asking that question. And so what triggers the need for an accepted drainage study or the letter is that you're going to platting or IPRC and trying to file your application. And if you got your preliminary arson plan approved a couple of years ago, what you're going to have to do is come back to SDS and say, hey, I'm trying to file this. I've filled out my drainage study acceptance letter. I need you to sign this. And here's the approved preliminary arson plan number. The, the trick is that through the, over the last four or five years, we've offered some simplified approaches. So the simplified detention method and there have been some projects that have worked with their reviewer to the point of pushing all the critical items to the final license plan review. We had, um, a, there's one particular project comes to mind, I won't name it, but basically 
the comments on the preliminary assessment plan could, could have been summarized as, we'll figure out everything later. And so in that case, that accepted preliminary assessment plan may not be a good drainage study or may not be acceptable as a drainage study. But in most cases, so the, the, um, the example I flashed up there with maybe four or five exhibits with all those drainage area exhibits, that was a good flood study or a good drainage study. That would have been just fine for moving forward to the next stages of development. So I hate to say it depends, but it kind of depends. And so I don't want to stop emphasizing, come and talk to me or my team about how to get through this process. We're here to help you. We're here to help guide you. It's one of the reasons we've added some of these questions to the checklist is what is your goal so we can help you get there? Uh, since we have the um, introduction of the master drainage plan for each project, will that help to eliminate some of the required documents on the plan set? So in order to reduce the amount of conflicts possible if you're having a drainage area map on the plan set, a drainage area map in the study, a, all the calcs in the study, a calcs on drainage plans. It may depend a little bit on your project. So the, the idea is to eliminate duplicate effort on both your part and ours. That's one of the things we tried to work into these process adjustments, not just respond to state law, but also take the opportunity to make some process improvements. So for example, your drainage study probably or it shouldn't include pipe calculations for proposed on-site systems or your subdivision. If you're doing a downstream assessment and you're analyzing a downstream pipe system, yeah, you'll have some HDL calcs in there for that pipe system. But if you're designing a single family subdivision, then all of your pipe HDL calcs should be in that standard table in the construction plan set, not in the drainage study. Okay, well, it, that looks like it's for the questions for now. I'm gonna pass off this presentation to Vic to let you know more about the IPRC process and the recent Acela updates. Okay, so the items we're gonna to discuss today, we're gonna to go over the Acela updates, uh, construction plan requirements, some miscellaneous items we kind of need to address as far as what's been happening uh, before the House bill and what's been happening during the House bill. And then uh, we're gonna do a live demonstration. So what I'm gonna to try to do is try to go through all the presentation within an hour or 45 minutes. There are gonna be some slides that I skip, but we will post the uh, presentation for everybody uh, online like we've done with in the past, back in 20, uh, 2018 when we had all those presentations. It will be online and available for everybody to, uh, to view and, and uh, look at, so. Okay, first we're gonna go over the solo updates. So first thing I wanna talk about is just the type of forms that we've had uh, develop over the past uh, couple of months with the House Bill 3167. Uh, first of all, you guys have been seeing a document that's called the Consultation Meeting Waiver. Uh, this is kind of the rules of engagement for all of us. If you guys ask us to review uh, a, either a plat or a construction plan, that document has got to be signed and sent back to us before we take a view of anything. Uh, just our interpretation from, from, from our legal standpoint is, you guys could give us a piece of paper with, a, with a scra uh, something scratched on it, and you guys could, could come back and say that's technically filed with us. So we're trying to be very uh, open, try to, uh, try to communicate as much as we can and, but we wanna do it within the, the guidelines of the law. Uh, under the IPRC, we have a pre-submittal conference request. Uh, we have the construction plan application. This is formally just a regular application. Uh, we have the response to disapproval or conditional approval application. We have the post-submittal meeting request. And then of course, everybody's been wondering where this amendment form has been. All the requests that we've been asking for it, well, we've got it finally published and uh, we'll share it with you guys shortly. From the construction office under the new house bill, uh, you guys are required to uh, select a material firm before you guys come in, before a pre-con can be scheduled. So there is a form and there is instructions on how to select a form from the construction office. Uh, for the water department, we do have the water sewer approved alignment walk, which needs to be uh, coordinated with the water department, along with the uh, water and sanitary sewer acceptance study. Uh, Stephen has already touched on the SDS requirements Transportation, we have a TIA approved study and then a TIA worksheet. And then we recently came in with a uh, planning, uh, excuse me, document. It's called the Platting IPRC Acceptance Letter. This was recently implemented because we've had some preliminary plats that have expired. 
or the plat that's been submitted to comply with the preliminary plat. So if you guys don't have this acceptance letter, we're not going to accept the application. Uh, in a couple of later slides, I'll show you where everything's going to be housed. Okay, so we've all encountered uh, upload uh, issues in the past. We've only been allowing uh, Internet Explorer 10 or Chrome 42. With the recent upgrade to Acela, you guys do have additional browsers that you can use. Uh, we've got listed them on the, on the uh, slide, Google Chrome 73, uh, Firefox 61, so on and so forth. Okay, so we're gonna get into the applications, which is actually gonna be a record when everything's finally accepted. Uh, right now we have eight different types of CFA uh, applications for the CFA process. Uh, the active ones we have right now are the Community Facilities Agreement, uh, the Infrastructure Plan Review Center, the IPRC Amendment, and then we just recently created the IPRC response to disapproval or conditional approval application, which is just your written response for the 15-day shot clock. Uh, we do have a pre-submittal request form, so there will no longer be any submittals and pay, uh, coming to us on Tuesday before noon. Everything's going to be online now. And then last uh, but not least, we, uh, we have the construction record, which is not shown in the ACA portal, but that is generated uh, during the IPRC workflow. Uh, there's two right now that are under development. We're working on the change order, and then also the uh, CFA, CFW developer uh, project pro, uh, proposal tool. So the pre-submittal conference request. So the purpose of the pre-submittal is just an optional meeting to allow the consultants to come in, talk about the projects, uh, go over comments with, before the 30-day shot clock filing date. Uh, the opportunity, the, the, the whole uh, uh, concept behind it is to try to seek approval on the first 30-day shot clock. Um, applications are our first come, first served basis. Uh, so all requests have to be submitted before 12 p.m. on Tuesday. We only have four time, we only have four slots available. So if you're that fifth time slot, you'll be the first one on the next cycle's uh, schedule. So the new requirements, uh, we are gonna have the pre-submittal request form, which is now online. You are gonna have to submit the detailed checklist once all the design manuals are up to date. Uh, you'll have to have an appro approved preliminary plat if applicable. Construction plans, you only have to have your preliminary seal information on it. Uh, the draft horizontal control plan, wanna be uh, clear on this. This needs to be included in the plan set, not as a separate file on the submittal date, okay? We need to have all approved study forms, all alignment work, uh, alignment forms, and then if you have any offsite infrastructure that you're connecting to, make sure you include that with your submittal. Uh, there is gonna be a transitional period that we are gonna look at trying to implement the new process uh, right now, we are looking probably next month, uh, but there's still some things that we need to discuss, but uh, we will let you guys know as, uh, as soon as we have an answer. Okay, the infrastructure plan review uh, application. New submittal requirements. Uh, it's gonna be an online application. You'll have to have an approved preliminary plat if applicable. Uh, your construction plans, every sheet will need to be signed and sealed uh, per our CFA ordinance. Uh, draft horizontal control plan included in the plan set. Uh, any offsite construction plans. And then I wanna to touch base on the construction standards dated. Uh, you know, we've got multiple uh, forms out there. What uh, the city's been doing as, as uh, specifications or details are upgraded or updated, uh, our city engineer has been posting the updated uh, versions in uh, Buzzsaw. So when you guys come in, there is a document out there that you guys need to make sure you are uploading the most recent information for us. And we'll get to that, we'll get to that down the road uh, and I'll show you where all that's gonna be uh, located at. Uh, we'll need a geotech report if applicable. And then you'll see a lot of the same requirements that I've uh, identified in the pre-sub. And then you'll have to pay your plan review fee. Okay, so the post middle meeting, that comes after the 30-day shot clock. Same, same concept. Uh, you've already got your disapproval from City Planning Commission. You guys have the option to come in and talk with us, just to go over comments, just to try to help facilitate you to get you out on the next 15-day shot clock. Uh, as noted before, uh, all requests have to come in before uh, 12 p.m. on Tuesday. Uh, we are giving precedence to the pre-submittals. 
over the uh, post submittal. So reach out to your project manager, let them know that you're interested in trying to schedule a post submittal meeting, and we will do everything we can to try to get you in. If not, then we'll try to get you in on the next cycle. As far as changes are concerned, nothing's really changed. Uh, you'll still have to submit the post submittal request form, which is still going to be a paper copy. Uh, redesign construction plans or red line comments received after city planning commission hearing. And like I said before, just uh, reach out to your PM assigned to uh, let us know if you want to schedule a post submittal meeting. Okay, the uh, next application is going to be the response to disapproval or conditional approval application. This is also uh, referred to as a 15 day shot clock or the written response. Uh, to the 30-day shot clock. New submittal requirements, nothing's changed. Uh, the only thing that we're going to have is it's going to be online. And then the amendment application. Uh, the purpose of this is to allow city staff to make modifications to the either the, the developer or the consultant in the contacts list. Uh, this form needs to be filled out and submitted to us before we make any modifications. Okay, so we've had some recent submittal inquiries that we want to discuss. Uh, if, I under, if I underestimate my plan review, can I use a personal check to supplement the difference? The response is yes, you can, a uh, personal check can be utilized. All we want to make sure is we get in the correct dollar amount for the filing, for the filing date. Do I need to pay additional fees if I include additional sheets after each review? The answer is yes. Any engineering sheet must be assessed at a plan review fee. Uh, the fees have got to be paid before the next review cycle. If not, we will not accept the, uh, the application for that filing date. And then the last comment is, can I file a written response to the plan commission's disapproved, uh, disapproval of the construction plans before the plan commission has been acted on to disapprove the construction plans during either the 30-day or 15-day shot clock? And the answer is no, under section uh, 2.12, excuse me, 212.0093 of the local government agreement uh, code, excuse me. Uh, you have to get a response from the plan commission before you can submit on your next filing date. Okay, so everybody wants to know what the house bill process looks like for IPRC. What I've done, I know uh, several months ago when Dana was here, we did give a presentation on the initial release of the uh, house bill process gone through, cleaned it up, broken it up into multiple slides. That way it's easier to follow. So the first slide shows the IPRC process for the 30-day shot clock. So as we stated before, you can schedule a pre-submittal meeting before you submit for your first filing application date. Um, the one thing we've changed since we went live the first time with the House bill is you now, you now are allowed to submit your CFA application after the uh, uh, after the uh, I, I, uh, IPRC application has been submitted. Initially, we had it at the very end before you went, before you could submit your uh, documents package. Um, I know there's a lot of questions as far as response time, why is it being held up in the city? So initially what we're trying to do is we're trying to adhere to the 14 day review cycle, which means that we have to give 14 days to all the PRT members to make comments. Five days after that, the PM is to go back and check and make sure there's a chapter and verse. After those five days are done, then they'll sit down with me because I have to develop the staff report. Um, so we're just doing a QA, QC just to make sure what we're giving you is a good product. You are going to see some comments that are like FY comments. That's your choice to make to make uh, make com or make revisions to your plans. Um, you are seeing a lot of BEPs, best engineering practices. Right now, there's a lot of information that we don't have captured in our design manuals, and we're working towards updating those. So those BEPs will eventually turn into chapter and verse. So what staff is trying to do right now is just get you acclimated to these uh, comments that are coming forth. Um, one thing I want to make note of on the process, uh, I know you guys have always had to reach out to the project managers to get your file numbers. We have the system programmed to where when we start the review cycle, there's a notice that's sent out to our water GIS and our TBW staff. They will issue uh, file numbers. And on the 14th day, when we finish that cycle, 
an automatic notification will be sent out to you directly or whoever's on the contact list listing all the project numbers. So that's one process improvement we've made. Um, and then like we talk, we've, talk, we've mentioned before, I know we've had some issues with the Scylla as far as getting comments to you guys. I'm hoping once we go live, all this uh, coordination from Dropbox, everything else that we're doing, it will go away and make this process a lot simpler. So on the uh, next slide, it's the response to disapproval or conditional approval application. Uh, like I mentioned before, this is your 15-day shot clock or your written response. Same process as the 30-day shot clock. It's just a condensed version uh, as far as uh, our review time. So we're giving staff six days to review and comment on the plans. Uh, two days, they've got to go back and make sure there's a chapter and verse. And then two days after that, they've got to meet with me to make sure we've got everything uh, uh, documented as, as much as we can to get back to you guys. And then, of course, we'll send out the staff report. And then we'll, the staff report will be set, posted uh, 72 days before planning commission. The last phase of the process is what we're calling the, uh, is the document review upload. As you guys seen before, this is nothing really new. All we've done is extracted the plan review from our compliance review and first reviews. Uh, in the document review, we're gonna be reviewing the project manual, uh, easements, agreements, if applicable, CFA exhibits, and then the material inspection fee worksheet. The construction office will be generating that construct, uh, material inspection worksheet. It's very critical that you guys note the working days in the project manual under the bid proposal section. If that is not listed, I've directed the PMs not to accept the project because without that information, we cannot generate that uh, uh, fee schedule for you guys. So as you can see, everything follows, uh, follows suit through the, uh, the old process. Once we're done, you guys will submit your final CFA exhibits, execute a bid proposal. CFA, that'll be the green light for the CFA office to start working on their documents. Once everything is done, we'll move into the electronic document package in. Uh, what we've changed is, I know there's been some inquiries about the CFA, uh, trying to remember how we had it labeled on the last, uh, on the last uh, workflow, but uh, we've revised it to say construction office fund accounts. Uh, this is just simply state getting the project ready for construction. Uh, Paul Chamberlain, who is one of our uh, staff uh, accounts, is setting those accounts up for you guys. Um, but everything else will follow suit. You'll still have to get clearance from SDS. Once you get that clearance from SDS, you can submit your construction package. Um, any questions on the process right now? I know I'm kind of flying through all the information, but like I said, we've got a lot of information to give you guys today, and I'm trying to make sure you guys are well informed of everything. Thank you mentioned um, we can submit first submit all IPRC plans via Acela. Can we also pay on Acela as well, or does that payment need to come through the a physical check? The payment will still have to become, you'll have to bring it down in person. Um, but part of the demo, I'll show you what we've, uh, what, what provisions and alter, alterations we made to the uh, applications, and I'll show you where, we, where we're now, uh, I'll show you where we're estimating the plan review fee for you guys, so. Okay, thank you. The uh, existing projects that we've already turned in, the hand submittals, are these gonna get transferred to Acela? They are. Or do we have well, to finish? What we've done is all the all the projects under the new house bill that have been submitted on a flash drive are actually in a cella. Oh, cool. So there's nothing that's gonna have to be uh, re re entered or anything on there on the on the uh, in a cella. Does uh, that so apply all to we're the doing is just gonna be opening it up back to the community. Does that apply to the CFA process too? That's I'm uh, just hearing that you can now start the CFA along with your first submittal. After you, after you have your first submittal in, then that's when you can start your CFA application. Okay. Yeah. And I heard you say that about the staff reports each time. Is that, an, 
I know I wasn't getting them till after or during the plan commission, but we're going to get them prior to now. We are working on that. Okay. Uh, just to let you guys know, we had 26 applications come in on this last cycle. So it's not a matter of we're not wanting to share it with you guys. It's just a lot of information we're having to put together just to make sure it's accurate and stated on the, on the staff reports for you guys. Okay. Thanks. But we are working on it. What's the method for requesting the pre-submittal and post-submittal meetings? Are those still in person or are those on a cell as well? Um, for the pre-submittal, that's going to be online. For the post-submittal, like I said, just reach out to your project manager. And if we have an available time slot, we'll fit you in on that, on that cycle. And when are those applications, um, when can you start submitting those applications? You can start submitting them on, uh, on Tuesday before noon. If you guys want to reach out to us earlier, that's fine. We're just trying to make sure uh, we don't miss a submittal date or submittal from, uh, from any applicant, uh, applicants. So. Is that midnight or 8 a.m.? 8 a.m. I've had too many late nights, so I don't want to see anything past, past 10 o'clock. So. Vic doesn't sleep anymore. I noticed on that uh, schedule it showed that on the first submittal we have to sign and seal the plans, have our final signature and our final seal on there. I've always preferred to put my preliminary seal on preliminary submissions. Is there any reason why we have to put our final seals on there? So the, the, the thought behind it was if, you got, if someone submits on a 30-day shot clock, right, and let's say the plans are stout, those plans are considered approved. So that's why we're asking you guys to, to submit plans with, a, with a, your seal and a signature on it. Okay. Because what, that's the official record with the City Planning Commission. Fair enough. I just don't want any of those sister plans floating around that look like they're finished getting in the contractor's hands. Yeah. All right, thanks. With that being stated, I'm going to move on to the next part of the presentation. Um, just to kind of touch on a couple of things I mentioned during this last uh, uh, segment. Uh, you guys will no longer have to coordinate with the PMs to get your file numbers. Uh, an automatic notification will be sent out to the consultants. And like I mentioned before, you guys are now required to reach out and select a lab before you guys come in uh, with the electronic documentation package. If that's not, if you guys don't have a lab selected, we are not going to push forward with getting a pre-con set up for you guys. That is a requirement. Okay, so the release date. So we are planning to go live February 24th, 2020, which is next Monday. So what does this mean? Like I've indicated before, no more flash drive submittals. All applications will be now handled via Acela, which also includes the pre-submittal. IPRC staff will no longer be creating applications. No more Dropbox communications. I know that's been a hassle for, for both, both sides of the fence on, 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 uh, on some projects we've encountered. And like I mentioned before, all fees will still have to be paid in person. The construction plan requirements. So I'm going to touch on the updated design manuals and ordinances on May 5th. Uh, excuse me, May 7, 2019 and June 4, 2019, Council approved the following design manuals and ordinances. Uh, it was the uh, installation policy and design criteria for water, wastewater, and reclaimed water infrastructure, utility construction policy, transportation engineering manual, manual, excuse me, TEM, and then the community facilities agreements ordinance, unit price ordinance, and then city code chapter 30, streets and sidewalks. Uh, as I mentioned before, staff is currently under uh, looking at the uh, at, at making updates to the manuals. And the ones that we're looking at right now are the wastewater, water, and reclaimed water, the TEM, and then the uh, Community Facilities Agreement Ordinance. Uh, our release date for these updates has not been determined yet. We're still working through a lot of information. But as soon as we get an update, we'll reach out to you guys and let you know. And then to locate all these design manuals and ordinances, just follow the link that we have posted on, this, on the slide. Okay, 
Going back to the ceiling requirements. So per uh, CFW ordinance number 23922-11-2019, all construction plans shall be signed and sealed by engineer of record at the time of filing. And then I've also quoted some uh, chapters from the Texas Board of uh, Texas Engineering Practice Act. Uh, this is a couple of things that we've encountered on recent submittals. Uh, there are some plans that are coming in where they're referencing city of Fort Worth details, but they're not putting a seal on there. And as, if you, as, as you look at the uh, at, uh, uh, ceiling specifications, uh, 137, 30, 31, physical electronic, oh, excuse me, stated the wrong one. So uh, this is going back to making sure that all the plans are signed and sealed. The second bullet that we've uh, identified is sealing procedures. When a license holder re reviews and elects to use standards or general guideline specifications, those items shall be clearly labeled such as shall bear the identity of the publishing entity and shall be individually sealed by a license holder or specified on an integral uh, design uh, title content sheet that bears the engineer seal signature and the date with a statement authorizing its use. If we come across anything that's not signed and sealed, that is an automatic recommendation for disapproval because you're not complying with our uh, rules and regulations. I'm gonna touch on what we defined 100% construction plan set. This was given in our presentations a couple of years ago, 29, 2018. Uh, IPRC defines a 100% construction plan set as having all the required components in a set of plans for review. Basic required components in a plan set are a cover sheet, draft horizontal control plan, general notes, CFW notes. We are seeing a lot of submittals that don't have our standard city of Fort Worth notes in there, so that make sure you guys are complying with that. Uh, water, sanitary sewer, grading, erosion control, drainage, pavement, street lights, traffic control, and construction details, which is ever, whichever is applicable for the project. All construction plans submitted for review shall comply with all recent design manuals and ordinances approved on May 7th and June 4th. Uh, only include public, uh, public improvements in the construction plan set. If there's private utilities are, that are crossing our water, our water and sewer lines or storm drain lines, those need to be shown on the plans and an encroachment agreement needs to be executed. Uh, one thing I wanna point out is on the residential developments, we are gonna request that you guys submit your uh, drainage and roadway plans. We aren't gonna assess a plan review fee, but in the event down the road that the city decides to come in and uh, take ownership of that property, everything has, gotta be everything has to comply with City of Fort Worth specifications. So make sure your pavement design matches the standard minimum si uh, th uh, pavement thickness, reinforcement size, so on and so forth. Flattening PDF files. This has always been an interesting conversation with the IPRC. Uh, so you guys wonder, how do we know when a file is flattened? So I took a screenshot showing you what we consider as not being flattened. If you look at the right, you'll see that there's Auto, uh, AutoCAD uh, SHX text. That tells us that the file has not been flattened. So there are some uh, instructions out there that we found for AutoCAD and Bluebeam on how to flatten files, so make sure you guys adhere to those, uh, uh, those uh, guidelines. This is, this is considered for us a recommendation for disapproval. The reason why we say recommendation for disapproval is because if the file's not flattened, we can't make comments. And if we can't give you comments, then we, we've wasted a review for you guys. Uh, just to let you guys know, besides the construction plans, we also are gonna request that the CFA exhibits be flattened project manuals flattened, and if they're not, and if these items aren't flattened, we aren't gonna accept the, the, uh, uh, the submittal. Okay, draft horizontal control plan. A draft horizontal control plan is simply a final plat just renamed. All information required on the final plat must be present on the draft horizontal control plan with the exception of providing a final plat number. A preliminary plat number should be shown on the draft horizontal control plan. And like I mentioned before, if the draft horizontal control plan does not comply with the approved preliminary plat, staff has no choice but to recommend disapproval of the construction plans based on this item. All offsite easements must be shown and noted on the draft horizontal control plan. Private streets, 
alleys and streetlights. I referred back to chapter 31, subdivision ordinance, uh, section 31-106, street design standards, private alleys and streets. Gone through and I've just listed a couple items that are listed under that ordinance. Uh, this goes again to what I meant. This goes back to what I mentioned before. Make sure your private streets that you're submitting for residential developments comply with our subdivision ordinance. Uh, I'm not going to go back. I'm not going to go through and read each one, but it's there for for uh, documentation. Uh, one thing I want to point out is if you have streetlights that are included in the construction plans, the streetlight plan shall indicate the location of the power source uh, required to illuminate the uh, private streetlights. So make sure you guys show that on our on the construction plans. And like I mentioned before, all private streets, alleys, and streetlights will not be assessed a plan review fee. Waiver request. So construction plan design standards, MTP amendment, street vacation, zoning, or other entity approvals are all various types of waivers. If a consultant is uh, requests a waiver to the construction plan design standards, he or she must notify each, either the PM or the project manager. Those waivers have got to be worked out before you guys come in and submit for the next filing date. Uh, we don't want any submittals coming in after, after the plans are submitted because the City Planning Commission has to act on the waivers on top of the construction plans. Uh, Going to touch briefly on the ETJ projects. Uh, we've had some recent uh, issues could develop on these type of projects. Uh, for projects located inside the City of Fort Worth extraterritorial jurisdiction, design standards shall comply with City of Fort Worth and corresponding county requirements. Um, if you're working in the county, make sure you let the project manager or the PRT member know uh, this is a project in the, uh, in the ETJ. Uh, several discussions we've had with Tarrant County. Uh, these are the kind of the guidelines we're going to follow. Only submit your CFA exhibits for water and sanitary sewer improvements. All paving and drainage improvements will be inspected by the county. Separate bonds for paving and drainage will be required by Tarrant County for ETJ projects. So make sure you're, you reach out to them because that's going to be required when you submit for the electronic documentation package. If those bonds are not there, we're going to send it back to you guys. Um, and then the consultant shall determine who will install, construct, and maintain all streetlights in the county. City of Fort Worth nor Tarrant County will be responsible for any streetlight maintenance. So make sure you guys have those issues flushed out and uh, told us how, or, or explained to us how things are going to, uh, how those streetlights are going to be installed. We are going to have to have further discussions with other counties such as Parker, Wise, and, Tar and Johnson. All right, just a couple of miscellaneous items I want to touch on here. Easements by separate instrument that has an assigned project uh, IPRC record. Consultants are required to submit all easements to their appropriate project manager. Consultants are required to, be, uh, to submit the following information. Two original copies for each easement. We are requesting an e easement closure report now. Uh, this will cut down on all the back and forth of, of review of the easements. Uh, we reached out to DAC, and DAC is on board with us requesting closure reports. So make sure when you guys submit your easements, we do have that information with us. Uh, Secretary of State uh, signature authority or delegation of authority, corporate resolution, or vesting deed. All that information has got to be submitted with the uh, easements. Consultants shall not submit easements directly to the property, uh, property management department. If you submit to the property management department, PM doesn't know what's going on, and you guys are aware, if we don't have easements in place, we're not going to construction. So make sure everything is filtered through the project manager. Okay, so a lot of you have questions about what do we do when there's not an assigned project manager. All those easements come to me. Uh, so when they come to me, you guys are required to submit the following information. Processing fee, two original copies of each easement, easement closure report, and then the Secretary of State authority or delegation of authority, corporate resolution, or vesting deed. Uh, if for those of you who don't have instructions on how to submit, reach out to me and I'll send you that information via email. And the same thing, do not submit any of those easements directly to property management because they're going to send it right back to me and they're going to ask me where's the check. If there's not a check, we're not going to process the, uh, the easement. So. 
I'm going to touch back. I'm going to go back, <laughs> and I'm going to touch on CFA exhibits because we are having some issues with this. Uh, just remember, the CFA exhibits are going to be a basic stick figure. Okay. The only thing I want to point out on this is we are still getting easements submitted that don't that say existing infrastructure when there's not inf existing infrastructure. If you're tying into something that's not existent right now, make sure you reference the project the, the, the project name, the city project number, and then uh, and then if it's and then the fa uh, the name of the development. This is one thing that's holding people up from going to construction because when we get down to reviewing the CFA exhibits and routing the CFA for execution, the information that's uh, presented on those exhibits is not accurate, then we gotta stop processing the CFA and reach out to you guys to make sure those exhibits are updated before we do anything else. Everything else, I'm just gonna go through these slides. It's for reference. Like I mentioned before, we are gonna post a presentation so you'll have all this information available. Going to the inspection and testing fees. Effective June 1st, 2020, if a CFA has not been executed, those legacy projects will now, will now follow the new fee schedule. Uh, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but we've had seed money that covers some of these overages on the old process. We no longer have that seed money anymore. So if you don't get your, your CFA ink before June 1st, that's why we're telling you right now because we are almost out of funds and the new process is a, a self-funded process with the material and inspection fees. Um, one thing I want to note on here that we've been getting wind of is on the bid proposal, you guys are using the old bid proposal form. The new bid proposal form states working days on there. If you guys submit calendar days, we're not going to accept that. So make sure you're using the correct one. The form has been out there for several months, uh, so make sure you go into Buzzsaw and you pull out the most accurate, uh, up-to-date form. Okay, uh, access to Buzzsaw. Moving forward, to access Buzzsaw, please use the following link. Uh, it'll be uh, fortworthtexas.gov uh, back, backslash uh, TPW backslash contractors. All the information that we're giving you right now is it's going to be listed under that under that link. You'll find our 2018 presentations that we've done. You'll find the link to Buzzsaw. Um, and on that web page, if you scroll down and and uh, to standards and detailed drawings, that's where you'll find the Buzzsaw link. All development related documents to IPRC are located under the resources folder, under the following subfolders: O2 construction documents, 30 new development resources. And then, the, of course, our uh, standard easements will be under 40 real property documents. Anything related to House Bill 3167, any forms, meaning acceptance letter forms, uh, alignment walk forms, post submittal, all that will be housed under 30 new development resources. And it'll be under a subfolder named forms. Okay. Before we get into the live demonstration, I'm going to open the floor back up to everybody for any questions that you guys might have. Vic, can you just expand on the forms bit there? Is that all forms, including water department letters, stormwater letters? That's going to be for all departments. We okay. want to make sure everything is centralized. That way, uh, consultants or developers are having to search through uh, different folders in, in Buzzsaw. Yeah, so the, the forms are on Buzzsaw and BIM 360 as well. Is there a plan at some point to get the payments made online instead of in-person check? We cannot accept any credit card payments because we've been told that if we accept credit card payments, we are charged a 3% processing fee, and some of the checks that we get are over 20000 So take that <laughs> percentage times that dollar amount. That's, what, uh, that's uh, dollars that the city doesn't want to have uh, to, uh, to pay out. I have a question about the uh, comment on the streetlight plans, kind of 
threw me off. It said there is no Which plan thing? review fee for streetlights. That's private. Okay. Yeah. But what if they're private? I guess it doesn't matter if they're private streetlights in the public set. That's what it said. Right. So what I mentioned on the, on the slide, let me get back there. Because if it's an IPRC set, then it's a public set, but private streetlights in it. So for the private streetlights, just like the just like the construction plans, paving plans, we're not going to charge you guys a plan review fee. Is that a new I mean, thing? I'm sorry. Is that new? This is something we've been going back and forth on. And okay. This is something we're trying to move forward with. Okay. And this is going to be updated in our new ordinance. So just moving forward, just to let you guys know, if you guys have private streetlights, show them in there. But we're not going to assess the plan review fee. Are they going to be reviewed still? Um. That's still be to that's still to be okay. uh, determined. All this all this information is just going to be for reference, like I mentioned before. Because if we come back and we accept a residential development that's private, right. we got to have some kind of reference as far as what was installed. And there's still a part of a maintenance agreement. Uh, that would I would need to check with Courtney Davis on that. Um, that's some some information we still got to touch on. All right, thanks. My question is dealing with platting in the county, if you have an ETJ project, the county will not release construction until the plat's filed, but the city, you have to have your construction done. So what is the process? I would need to reach out to Mary Elliott on that. That's an, that's something I don't have a response to for you guys right now. Okay, because that's a serious time stopper. Sure, I understand. I'm wondering if some of these questions that we don't have the expertise to answer here in this room, maybe you can send us an email. And when we send out the slides and everything else, the rest of the group will try and get answers to these questions. That for right away abandonment, do we, does that need to be taken care of before we do our? And God help me, draft horizontal control plan and construction plans are done. I think on the draft horizontal control plan, we'll, I'll, I will follow back up with planning and development. But from my understanding, the draft horizontal control plan will show any easement. Uh, vacation on there. So make sure you show it on the draft horizontal control plan first and then come in with your uh, abandonment. Will any of the house bill modifications affect you once you're in construction? Will you have to, if you have plan revisions or anything like that, will you have to go back for CPC approval again on those? Okay, so let me touch, touch on that because uh, we've had that conversation already. If it's a major design change, you guys are going back to city plan commission and construction is going to be halted. If it's a minor design change, then we have the governing authority to make that decision. So I'm going to give you an example. We had some franchise utilities on a project that hadn't been worked out, and they wanted to submit for a filing uh, on a revised filing date. I told them, if you don't have that worked out, and you guys submit and city planning commission uh, acts on that and approves the plans, if we get into construction and it's a substantial amount of money that's involved to do that change order, you're going back to plan commission. As the culverts within the right of way, how is that going to be processed? Is it through the uh, parkway permit process or will it be always through the IPRC? Uh, could you repeat the question? For culverts within the right of way, will they always be processed through the IPRC or can we go through the parkway permit process? So we are looking at that information right now, just to let you guys know what we've been seeing is the plans submitted through a parkway permit aren't a full blown design. Uh, so we are just getting uh, drawings from consultants showing just a, a plan view, not showing us a profile. So the direction I've given everybody right now is if you have a culvert crossing that's going in under a parkway permit, that needs to be reviewed by us. Now, if if we're gonna take you through the house bill process, that's a different story, but that's uh, procedures that we're working through right now. I'd say as of right now, we'll work with you guys in externally outside of the uh, house bill process. But in the event something triggers it to go through the house bill process, then that would be the uh, uh, method moving forward. Some of the challenges we encounter are driveway culverts or road culverts that I installed to grade. And so stormwater has to go back and correct it. 